Okay, so it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon and tell you a bit about the world uh, I live in. I'm kind of a psychologist interested in the senses, um, but maybe one of the most multi-sensory of all our experiences uh, is food and drink. And that's where most of our research has been over the last few years, trying to apply insights about the brain, the mind of the diner, uh, to design things in restaurants, but also in supermarkets differently. And today I want to focus a little bit on the world of sort of food and technology and creativity at that nexus and what role a psychologist, or as we've rebranded re ourselves, gastrophysicists, what role we might play. And when we kind of initially think of technology at the dining table, very often we think of things like this, all of those diners distracted with their mobile devices, either not talking to their partner at the table, and certainly not concentrating on the food, but uploading an image of that dish to share with their social networks. Something that a growing number of chefs are becoming annoyed about, that when the food comes from the kitchen perfectly prepared at just the right temperature, the diner's getting up, taking pictures, moving around, by which time the food is cold, and not as it was supposed. Uh, to be. This is the bad side of technology and food, just like the television that sits in the side of the room when so many of us eat, and that may lead to our e-consuming 30% more food with the TV on than with the television off. It's one of the simplest kind of dieting tricks, is just turn the technology off uh, and you'll eat less as a result. These are the bad sides. And maybe we should not be surprised that, um, that technology plays this role, that so many of us are interested in the world of kind of gastro porn, food porn, as a term first coined by uh, Alexander Cockburn back in 1977, describing one of um, uh, French chefs, Paul Bacuzzi's cookbooks, an expensive exercise in gastro porn. And this sort of world of food images, gastro uh, pornography, has been growing and growing. Uh, and now our TV sets, at least in the UK and in many other countries, are now increasingly filled with hours upon hours of innuendo. Here we have Nigelissima, kind of uh, Britain's favourite food porn uh, chef, uh, purveying recipes on the television of, of cakes that may contain nine to 10,000 calories you see them on the screen, it does something to you, but hopefully you will not cook it, or else you'll be um, uh, uh, suffering the consequences as a result. Um, and this is kind of growth in food porn on the television of the 30 to 40% of diners taking pictures of their meals in the restaurant uh, sort of fits when you think about the brain and what we've evolved to do. The single thing that our brain gets most excited about is not the real pornography, it is, in fact, gastroporn. And when a hungry diner uh, sees one of their favorite dishes, perhaps if they can even smell it as well, some studies have found a 24% increase in brain's blood flow. May not sound like a lot, but our brain is our body's most bloodthirsty organ, and it really gets excited by images of food. Nothing we can do about it, but how can we use that knowledge from neurogastronomy in order to um, design better experiences for those uh, that we serve? One suggestion comes from this, this work from Charles Michel, a Franco-Colombian chef, who's interested in sustainability, as we heard about in the last talk, um, and gets very upset that his colleagues in Colombia don't want to eat all the amazing ingredients of the Amazon. They want French food, they want Italian food. He's trying to use psychology to change people's perception of what they eat and how much they like it. And this is one of his takes. It's kind of Kandinsky on a plate, playing to Apicius' uh, claim from a couple of millennia ago that we eat first with our eyes. The neurogastronomy certainly says that, if you know that. If you take works of art, put them on a canvas and serve them to people, that very simple salad... Uh, is rated much more highly when it appears like uh, one of Kandinsky's paintings, this one hanging the other way up at the Museum of Modern Art in London. Uh, they'll eat more of this healthy salad than if I serve it to you as a regular tossed uh, collection of ingredients. So that's kind of creativity in uh, neurogastronomy. What about the technology? Well, increasingly we're working with chefs like uh, Albert Landgraf, and this is his signature dish from his restaurant, A Piece in Sao Paulo. I've never met the man, um, he's one of South America's up-and-coming young chefs, but we saw this bit of gastro porn uploaded onto the internet, thought what a beautiful dish it is, three onions with some tapioca spume. And you sort of ask him, you know, why did you plate the dish that way? Why are there three onions, not four? Well, we all know odd numbers are better, better than even numbers on the plate, at least we think we know that. Um, 
and, and he did think about the dish. He did think about its presentation. He knew it looked lovely, but he didn't really test to see whether this was the optimal presentation for the eye. Uh, with his permission, we took his uh, uh, dish, put it on the internet, and did crowdsourced um, testing to saying, imagine you saw this dish, um, and you're coming to uh, Albert's restaurant tonight. How would you like it plated? And diners on the internet can see the onions spinning round and around. And sometimes this is something we've all kind of done. You go to a restaurant, the waiter puts the dish down before you, and sometimes you just kind of just tilt the dish a little bit. It won't make it chain taste different, but it can make its eye appeal greater. We're capturing that on the internet. If we put the chef's dish up at 6 p.m., then by the time we're going to the bar for the second orders, we'll find that uh, a majority of those on the internet say, yes, we kind of like the orientation. Each dot here is one diner potentially going to the restaurant saying how they would like the dish plated. By next morning, uh, we've got 2,000 diners potential diners and their responses to this dish. And we can see the biggest peak here is around uh, three minutes past 12. So the chef was almost right, not quite, people like it just a little bit past 12 o'clock, but close enough perhaps not to care. But it's the method that's important, the crowdsourced online testing and evaluation of dish design that in the very short term that allows the chef to create a dish one day test it overnight and know how to design it optimally for the next day's service. And then once we've done that, we can actually kind of hack the plate and again put all versions of three onions, one onions, onions out, inwards, upside down, backward to front, all sorts of possible platings of this dish and see what orientation people like most and what they might perhaps be willing to pay most for. Uh, let's give you an example. So here we have one example of contemporary plating. It's the asymmetric plating. You'll ask chefs, why do you do it? I say, well, it sort of looks nice, and I saw this guy or girl doing it somewhere else, and I just thought, but everything we know from the visual arts says we like balance, we like harmony, and that's not what is going on on this plate. So we can take dishes like that or like this, put them on the internet, and monetize how much people would be willing to pay, not just what looks nice and what looks doesn't, but how much cash would you actually pay in a restaurant for these dishes, and we find with exactly the same food here, ox cheek and seasonal vegetables, when plated centrally, people are willing to pay significantly more in the restaurant for exactly the same food. And certainly some of the food companies are very interested in this kind of result. Then perhaps we can take a little bit of, um, uh, of the psychology of perception and apply it onto the plate. If you look at the image on the bottom left of the screen, this is kind of a classic from visual perception gestalt psychology literature. Just looks like a collection of dots to begin with. Hard to make out what's in the scene. But if you stare and you stare long enough, uh, something should emerge. You should see a Dalmatian dog with its nose to the ground. Uh, here its nose, the legs here, sniffing the ground. Um, and once you've seen the dog emerging from the background, whenever you see this image again in your life, you will immediately see the dog. It will pop out to you in a way that it did not before. Can we take these ideas and put them on the plate? Uh, well, we tried it with chef Joseph Yusef from London's Kitchen Theory on the right. This is the Picasso dish. Picasso famously said, in all acts of creation start with an act of destruction. And again, we saw that from the previous talk. Uh, and we're taking emergence, we're taking face configuration effects. And when the dish is plated before the diner, most people... Picasso, where is he? He's in there somewhere. It's a little bit hard to see, but if I spin the plate, hopefully you'll see his stenciled half face appearing to you. Then once you've seen this dish, much like the Dalmatian, uh, you perceive it differently once the elements have em emerged and configured together and forever after you can't help but see Picasso in a way that he was not there uh, before. Um, but ultimately, I think our brain doesn't care so much about art on a plate and clever tricks. It's really caring about color and predicting taste. With dishes like this, a little bit hard to see. We've got white, we've got brown, we've got green, we've got red, but which taste is which? That's what your brain is trying to decide. Avoid the bitter, uh, look for the sweet. And this dish we're testing on the internet, serving in the restaurant setting. In fact, the majority of diners will say white is on the left, then brown is bitter. Green is probably sour for 70% of people, and red seems to be sweet. And we can test this dish on the internet and find out how diners in different parts of the world uh, respond. Um, but we never actually see the color of food in isolation. We always see it against a background or a backdrop 
of the plate. And this is where our work with the Elysia Foundation comes in, uh, together um, uh, with, with Fran Adria's team. We've taken a dish, what looks like a sweet, because it's pink, strawberry dessert, in fact it is, but when we serve that dish in the restaurant setting from a white plate, people will say it tastes 10% sweeter and 15% more flavorful than exactly the same batch of ice cream from the black plate. Same restaurant, same day, all we've done is change the plate color, and yet it does change the taste. Again, this done in the real restaurant, how can technology help? Well, if we just forget about the food and just take pairs of colors, put them on the internet and ask people, what color combinations do you think would be the sweetest or the most bitter? Then here we have the results from an overnight study where we see for sweet taste on the left, it's pinky white. For the bitter taste, the most bitter tastes are black and white, uh, black on red. Exactly the color combinations we were testing in the Elysia Foundation. As yet, we don't know whether this is just coincidence or something more important, but maybe we can use the power of online testing to develop the ultra-sweet color combinations that will enhance the taste of the food without requiring uh, the uh, calories or the sugar. Um, what about sound? I think we use sound to augment the experience too, not just vision. It can be something like this with Denis Martin from Vevey in Switzerland, a modernist take on the gin and tonic. Gin and tonic in a balloon, blow it up, put it in the liquid nitrogen. It comes out as this amazing sphere, amazing to look at, to taste, but it's missing something. It's missing the sound of the fizz. So what we're working with a condiment junkie to try and augment the plateware in this case to deliver the fizz back into the dish that has been cooked out and deliver the true multi-sensory experience through the plateware and the food combined. Or it could be this. Uh, the sound of the sea, seafood dish from the fat duck in Bray, building on a work on the sonic chip. Um, and we've done the research to show that this kind of seafood, an oyster, will taste significantly better if you have the sounds of the sea than if I play restaurant jazz to you, if I play restaurant cutlery noises. Um, get the atmospheric sound right and you can enhance the taste of the food. In this case, the, the iPod coming from the conch shell served at the table and the signature dish at the restaurant. One of the first examples, I think, of technology at table, not to distract you from the food, but to take an already wonderful tasting dish and elevate it a little bit higher through the everything else. And that idea of technology at table and using it to augment the sound of the experience, either the sound of the food, the sound of the background of a certain environment around the food, has been taken over to uh, Shanghai to uh, ultraviolet French chef Paul Paré, serving what his take on fish and chips, what we thought of as a quintessentially English dish. And here you see him projecting the British flag through technology on the table. The dish comes out and you hear the sounds of the sea. It's followed up by uh, the Beatles, quintessentially English group, and is projecting the English uh, kind of weather on the walls, the rain spattered thing. All the technology designed, again, to enhance the great taste of the dish. But there's one third way in which sound can augment the taste of food that we're really excited in. There's a bit more synesthetic in nature, a surprising connection between taste and hearing, and one that again developed out of a collaboration with a fat duck um, and a sound design agency. This from the House of Wolf restaurant in London, one course for each sense. Down at the bottom is the bittersweet uh, sonic cake pop. And on the menu it says dial 0845 24 something if you want to make your dessert taste sweeter. Dial a different telephone number on your mobile device if you want to make it taste more bitter. And the question is, which of these two sounds is sweet and which of these two sounds is uh, the more bitter one? That's one soundtrack you might be dialing on your mobile device to add seasoning to the dish through technology. This is the other. And when we test this online, when we test this around the world in different musical cultures, the majority of people will say that second sound is just somehow sweeter. It cannot literally be sweeter, but we've done the research to show it will add 5 to 10% sweetness to the dish. Uh, it's all great, all happens in the modernist restaurants, but most of us don't get to eat there very often, if at all. Does what happens in the modernist restaurant stay there, or can it be scaled up to a larger environment? I think it can. I'll give you end with a couple of examples of how that is happening. One from work with British Airways for their long-haul flights from about 18 months ago. They came to the House of Wolf. 
They understood the power of sonic seasoning. Uh, and then for their long haul passengers, you could order something from the card in the plane, then plug in your headset and get music that had been designed to enhance the taste of the airline food. Starts in the modernist restaurant, but it can be scaled up. Or look in the supermarket and you'll find many examples like the Hagen dazs Concerto app out there, where you buy your ice cream, you download the app, and then you have music designed to match the taste of the ice cream and augment the experience. And many brands are thinking in this way how to use the technology uh, for uh, food. Um, okay. I shall just leave you with a couple of examples back on the, on the visual case here um, about the technology and food. Again, starting in the restaurant, if we've got the sound of the sea, why not plate from a tablet? Now that we've given up using tablets to order from, from restaurant menus. A lot of them sitting around. Maybe we can tell stories about the food, its origin, the farmer, uh, through plating that way. Uh, or maybe it's something like this from Andres uh, Caminada over in Switzerland. Kind of an ironic take on plating from technology. I don't know what the correct answer is, what the solution will be, but something in this space I think will come out in the next year or two and will be used to enhance our experience of food, perhaps delivering the same food with less of the unhealthy stuff or creating a more memorable, meaningful uh, experience. And I'll leave you just with this example uh, from the technology from a few years in the future, I think. Uh, this from Katsu Okajima in Japan, vision scientist, taking an augmented reality setup. We have original sushi on the left, we have augmented reality sushi on the right. And we're imagining a time a few years from today when we've fished the seas to extinction of some of our favorite sushi fish. Maybe if we know about the neurogastronomy, if we know about the importance of what we see to what we taste, we can bring back some of those lost experiences at the table. Here done without the use of meta cookies or anything else in real time. And it's kind of an exciting future uh, uh, looking uh, forward. And this sort of technology there is coming. Um, we're seeing it in visual augmentation. We're seeing the sonic augmentation of the meal. And I think we're going to see the, the olfactory augmentation too as the top chefs with the, with the technologists here, Arzac in Spain, working with Philips to create a truly multi-sensory plate that glows, that releases scent, that may even play sound and vibrate. Um, and this is a future I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, and I think it will take the creative skills of the chef, augment them with the technology, and the gastrophysicist here will try and use their skills as measurement scientists in order to deliver the best possible combination, picking up on the creative's intuitions, but measuring them in a way that doesn't constrain creativity, uh, but offers something exciting to look forward to. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>